So now, like in Parliament, it's question time. I gave you a hard time now for nine hours. Now you can, you can give me a hard time for the last hour. So let's see whether you succeed. A bit of competition, huh? Can you name the unresolved questions in immunology which are crucial for understanding or can you like point out uh, the high stands of uh, today's science in that area? So did you hear what the question was? Whether I could name the unresolved questions that would be required to understand the function of the immune system? That was the killer question. I'm dead now. <laughs> so finished. Question time is over. <laughs> I can give you my personal opinion, of course, what is interesting, and you can guess from what we are working on that this is what I consider is interesting, but any other scientist would, of course, say many other questions are interesting. I think that is very difficult to say. I, for one, have very much liked to, having been trained, as I said, as a physician, to now study these uh, most unlikely creatures, and by comparing their function, I think I've learned quite a lot, but that's the only thing I, I can say. Pick your question, I have millions of questions. One good piece of advice, I think, is take old textbooks, textbooks that come from the 19, 19th century, read through them, and if you find a question where there is no answer, this is probably a very important one and a very interesting one, that people haven't either for, have either forgotten or haven't found a way to attack it. The ones that are seemingly obvious are not very interesting because you will have, either they are not interesting or you have too much competition. And if you want to establish yourself as scientists, pick the ones that nobody wants to work on. Yeah. So I'm not sure whether I got the question. You, you are interested now in the connection between the role of this transcription factor in the thymus and in the skin. Is that the question or yeah. part of it? Okay, good. So I'll, this is rel relatively simple to answer. This is why I picked that part of the question. <laughs> we, 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 know the, we know the target genes of this transcription factor in the different tissues. So in the hair follicle, FOXN1 regulates expression of hair keratins, but only a certain subset of them um, um, in the hair shaft, so that the, although these mice are labeled nude, they are not nude. They, this is basically some sort of genetic uh, uh, shaving machine because the hair is simply structurally weak. So when the hair emanates from the skin through the hair follicle, and when the hair is rigid enough, of course, it sticks out of the skin. But in this case, when the keratins are not formed properly, the hair just is not rigid enough to come out of the skin, and it crumbles. And when you do a section of a nude skin, then you see all these bits and pieces of broken hair inside the skin. So it's not, it's not hairless. That's a misnomer, it simply does not emanate to the cell surface. And when you look at the whiskers, the whiskers are not straight and nice and long, they are kind of crumbled and it's very easy to see the difference. So there the, the targets are structural proteins that are required to build the hair properly, but only a subset of them, but this subset apparently is required to confer rigidity on the, on the, uh, on the hair. But this is, this is an acquired function because in the original 
uh, function of FOXN1 that is in the, the thymic or pharyngeal epithelium, there is of course no hair keratins. Hair keratins are a new invention during evolution. Um, but of course it might also regulate keratins that are cons cons uh, constitutive elements of all epithelia in the thymus, but there is no evidence for this at the moment. It has the, so many target genes, some of which I mentioned in my presentation. So this is a, a case where a transcription factor was recycled. It was reused in a different cellular compartment and assigned to do other things than it used to do or still does in another tissue compartment. Presumably it has other cooperating factors just to make it specific, but that is what it is. Your first part was about cancer of the thymus, is that? No. Oh, 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 I see what you mean. Okay, keratinized bodies. Yeah, there is, when, when, you, when you do um, uh, histology of the thymus in humans, you find what are referred to Hassel's corpuscles. And those are cells or aggregates where there is a lot of keratinization, and this is why people, this is what he probably meant, this is why people linked the function of FOXN1 to its function in the skin or in the hair shaft. But Hassel's corpuscles, you might be able to see them in sharks or in a shark thymus or structures that could be considered the equivalents and they don't have any hair as you know. So there is no real direct connection. It might just be that it somehow influences differentiation of certain epithelia but I don't think it's a direct correspondence between a Hassel corpuscle and the, the hair. For example, in mice, it's very difficult to see them, actually. They're more prominent in humans. Okay, so I have that question. Next one. Can you modify the antigen-specific T cell to respond to some other antigen? The well, question is, can I change the specificity of the T cell? Artificially. Artificially. Yes, of course, you can. Um, you could take... A, um, a, a, a T-cell line that expresses one T-cell receptor and you could simply mutate the T-cell receptor and see what the specificity is like. So that can be done either through cDNA cloning, introducing specific changes and reintroducing and then see what happens. Or you can think of perhaps some sort of endogenous uh, system that generates mutations in the, in the T cell receptor locus. And uh, can it, is it used now in medicine, and if not, why? Oh, he's asking the real questions, huh? God, yeah, well, it's, it, it's of course, it's not easy. If you imagine you want to, you're probably getting at why can I not use T cells to do something specifically for me, attack a tumor or attack some infectious right. tissue or something. That is, of course, being tried. Um, but there are lots of problems with this. The, prob the, the, the basic problem is it's perhaps not so much the matter of specificity, it's is the, the matter of getting the T cells to act against the tissue you want. So there is some argument now that tumors, for example, manage to surround themselves with uh, T regulatory cells that suppress the function of effector cells. So if you were able to get, get rid of, specific, get rid of specific, specifically of the T regs, you might then call these effector cells into action. So it might not be a matter of the immune system not being responsive at all, but the tumor being capable of generating a counterforce that is a suppressive environment via T-Rex, for but example. But if you inject uh, enough amount of T cell, then it should be uh, it should suppress this uh, defense. There is of course competition. Yes, that is true, but. T-Rex function, amongst other ways, function by eating survival signals for effector T-cells. So they consume a lot of IL-2, for example. And IL-2 is important for immune responses by, or immune activation by T-cells, or when you want to activate T-cells. How long the T-cell uh, lives without this uh, survival signal? That, I think, depends on the type of T-cell, but I couldn't give you a precise answer. So it's not over, I don't think it's so easy as to overpower the suppressive environment because another 
mechanism, of course, is these your T cells, your antigen-specific T cells against the tumor need to get access to the tumor. That might also not be so easy in all cases. And if you inject them right in the tumor, it doesn't... That might be a possibility, but normally you're not dying of the primary tumor. When you have a tumor, you die of metastases, and they normally occur in places where the surgeon can't get any hands-on. So that, is, that might be difficult. If you knew where all the metastases were, you could perhaps take them out surgically, and then you would be cured. I don't think the, the primary tumor is the major problem for a tumor patient. And can this, uh, can this busting up this, this way of creating artificial T cells, can this busting up the, just uh, the time when you cure up yourself? Because, for example, if you are vaccinated or if you are given treatment, then some time should pass before the immune system will react. And if you create artificial T cells, for example, you have a flu and you create artificial T cells uh, for the antigen of that flu, mm -hmm. then you just inject and then immense re response uh, should be given, right? Well, that is, that is called adoptive T cell transfer. You, you can think of it's, it's actually being considered in a number of uh, situations. In the clinic, for example, after bone marrow transplantation, when many patients suffer from uh, reactivation of cytomegalovirus, and to uh, fight against CMV, you need T cells, and then one option would be to transfer CMV-specific T cells to help fight that uh, emerging or reactivation. This second. So they do it right now. That's already being done. Yes. So. In principle, that is possible. People use it against tumors. When they think they have identified tumor-specific antigens, they do it against infections in various ways, but it's, of course, a very complicated procedure. And what's the price, just to mention it? What's the price of doing such... Uh, you mean price in terms of dollars? Yeah, yeah, in for one patient. <laughs> just, just an estimation, right? I don't know. I. I don't know. Depends on where you are. If you are in the United States, I think it's probably more expensive than if you are in Germany, I would think. A cup ten thousand dollars or more. Much more. Much much more. Hundred thousand, right? Even more, yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not an option that you could entertain if you walk into a primary physician's office. Give me a shot against flu. That's not so easy. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you do that? Yeah. No, 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 100, so he, 100, he said. 100. And so we can uh, estimate all possible uh, uh, 
This the last bit I did not get. So uh, uh, we can blame uh, DT in producing auto specific uh, uh, antibodies. Okay, we can blame and it to, to produce uh, auto specific. Uh, uh, yes, auto -specific, yes, yes, yes. Uh, auto specificity is yes. derived from yeah. VDJ region. No, the TDT produces random additions, yes, random and but VDJ also because. Yeah, yeah, but the fusion, if, even if there is no TDT, the, the fusion of, of two elements, say V and D, through non-homologous end joining also produces random sequence. So random sequence is both in the TDT, which amplifies the problem, as it were, but also in VDJ. That's the key thing. The VDJ alone, any double-stranded break you make is resealed, if it works, and this repair process is error prone. So we have, and TDT just amplifies the problem because it adds nucleotides. So it's clear that these two mechanisms contribute to diversity and potential auto, auto reactivity. Yes. Yeah. So uh, now. I think that all uh, VDJ regions. You mean all of them must be auto-specific because the number of auto-antigens is so few compared yeah. to the degree of, of, of diversity? Well, one simple answer would be if we just take these numbers, you could say you have 10 to the power of 12 different specificities that attack one epitope. Because you could see one epitope in different ways, yet it's the same epitope. It's not preventing you from distinguishing epitopes when you look at this from different angles, which would then factor into these numbers, but this would still remain the same. No? No, uh, because uh, if we consider uh, any possibilities for uh, outer epitope, why we don't consider such possibility for another foreign epitopes, not uh, outer? We, we, uh, we can multiply it, for example, in uh, 100 cells, and we must use this, this such number, this number. I'm not sure whether I really get the question. The, the point is, from, what you, from, from these numbers, which are perhaps a bit high, but nonetheless, these numbers, in terms of diversity, certainly are greater than the number of different epitopes in proteins. That might well be so. But that simply, the, the simple inference would be that you have many, many receptors that can see the same epitope. So if we weed out all the receptors that are against this, these epitopes, that would leave a, still quite a large number of specificities that could see foreign epitopes. But what's wrong with this? Uh, we can divide this, this and 
we can uh, obtain Oh, you mean now we can then calculate that 10 to the 10 different epitopes from foreign structures can be seen by these receptors. This is what you mean? Uh, I think uh, uh, we can divide 2.8 and uh, possible, all possible numbers of uh, yeah. uh, possible epitopes and we uh, obtain Pure, a very pure uh, possibilities for generating uh, autoreactive epitope in absolutely random uh, generation uh, of T cell receptors and antibodies. Okay, I did not get that reasoning. Can anybody help me? I think this, this equation is the wrong way around. We have 10 to the 18th divided by this, not, the, not, not this way. So we have, say, a million specificities per self-epitope. No, no, no. Uh, this um, estimated frequency of outer... Uh, of frequency, yes. Okay, that, of course, then you have to, have to do it like this. But nonetheless, I mean... I don't, still don't think that I get the question now. It's all being taped and put on the internet, so it's totally embarrassing. I have to, I have to um, think about this. Maybe we can write emails and you explain it to me a bit better so I can understand it. Maybe it's too late in the day. I don't know. But I don't quite get the, the question. It's... Uh, Yeah, of course. I mean, that's also true. It depends on the number of lymphocytes you have to represent that diversity. You don't have enough lymphocytes to represent all these 10 to the 18s, that's for sure. But you could say, look in the population, we certainly have more than a billion. So we, are, we probably have to 10 to the 12 or something in terms of T-cells. That is also true, but there's all sorts of... Uh, Out of all of these lymphocytes, will have uh, 
uh, this uh, will be much, much higher because if you like one minus this law in the power of number of lymphocytes, then there might be an answer. Okay, good. So move on to the next question. Thank you for saving me. Can we derive a T cells from stem cells? Can we derive a T cell from stem cells? Yes, it has been tried to um, use um, or to generate T cells in vitro. That is the question. If we have a T cell that has a certain specificity, can we make more of this? Yes, it can, it, it can be done. And it also has been tried to make T cells simply by using hematopoietic stem cells, for example, or as an alternative uh, ES cells or induced pluripotent cells and give them in the, put them into the right uh, environment and then differentiate them to T cells. It's possible to bring them to the um, double positive stage, as I showed you, sometimes even to the single positive stage, but these cells, of course, are not selected in any form. That is very difficult to do. So we can't select them? No, because you have to then create an environment that mimics the situation in the, in the thymus with the plethora, of, for example, of self-antigens. If, you, if you're generating T cells from a stem cell, and you initiate somatic, uh, somatic diversification, then you generate all sorts of specificities, and then you have to decide which one you want. But it is possible, for example, maybe that answers your question, it's possible to take a lymphocyte and go through the induced pluripotent state and derive a mouse that is then monoclonal because this receptor is pre-arranged pre -rearranged and because of allelic exclusion, all the T cells or B cells will make the same receptor. So that is possible. Incidentally, an experiment that was done by in the Odi Yenish lab that showed that a differentiated lymphocyte is still capable of giving rise to an entire organism, which I think is, of course, answering a pressing problem whether there is more genetic change in a lymphocyte than just rearranging and reassembling the antigen receptor genes. And since it's possible to do this, to take a nucleus from a lymphocyte and make an entire mouse, this cannot be. And we can't take a lymphocyte from one person and modify it to be a lymphocyte for another person, right? Well, if the T cell receptor sees the MHC of the second person in a specific fashion and not just in a non-specific alloreactive fashion, yes. That would be possible. But the way to do this is, of course, if you identify a certain... This is being done when people are building T cells in generic form that treat or to treat tumor patients. So they select one particular MHC haplotype. So they have a T cell, for example, that is restricted to MHC class 1A2. They know that when this MHC molecule presents a peptide X, that this T cell receptor will react to it. So and if we two ha happen to have the same MHC haplotype, and we ha then that will be the same epitope. And my T cell receptor would then also work in your, um, in your body if I transplanted this T cell receptor transgenically into your hematopoietic system. And what's yes. the probability that you have the same? MHC type, you right. mean? Yeah, that's, that's the same probability that you can calculate from the distribution of MHC alleles, and this amounts to basically the same problem that the transplantation physicians have when they, for example, search for a bone marrow donor for a leukemia patient. So, and if, that, if you are restricting this to a single MHC peptide complex, then it's much easier. For example, HLA-A2, is very frequent in the population. I'm not sure whether how frequent it is here, but we have 20, 30 percent in middle Europe. That probably is very similar here. So the chances are that every uh, maybe third or fourth in the room has this allele. So this is why the, all these efforts are being focused on frequent MHC alleles. Yes, just a no, no, now we have to s give him the chance. It seems that there is a, such a trend in the society now that many people refuse to immunize their babies because somewhere they've heard that 
it's more dangerous than its benefit. So is there any scientific reason for that? Yes, that is, is, it is true. I think it's particularly true for affluent societies that people begin to think that vaccination is not a good idea. And I have a very strong opinion about this because, the, of course, there is always the danger of some undesired side effect. But that needs to be compared to the beneficial effect of immunization as such. And that, of course, can only be decided on the population basis, not on the individual basis, because if you have a an undesired reaction in an individual, of course, this is what you don't want. But statistically speaking, they are normally quite low. And um, I can tell you one thing, in, in our region, uh, in the southern part of Germany, close to the north of Switzerland, people refuse to have their children vaccinated against measles, for example, measles virus. And we have measles disease outbreaks every now and then. And I even, I have to admit, I even have this discussion with one of our daughters who now has uh, children on her own and we discuss uh, uh, vaccination schedules, which I thought would never happen in my own family. But that is so strong now, that movement, that it's not a good idea to uh, vaccinate your children that I've, I even have trouble convincing my offspring of the value of this. But I think it's, if you ask me, I think it's utterly wrong. Um, because, uh, there are, of course, you know what happens when you don't uh, vaccinate. There are, of course, sequelae after the, the, the resolution of the disease that are quite severe, and this you would hopefully avoid by vaccination. It, it's a societal problem, I think. Uh, does this risk increase when you give several immunizations to different no, not really, no. Because you mustn't, for, I think that came from some thought, when in the, in the laboratory, of course, you, you tend to study infections with a single agent or with a sing, single antigen, because you want to have the least possible complication in interpreting the results. But in real life, that, of course, never happens. You are infected with HIV, you are infected with CMV, you are infected with some fungus, and it's the co-infection that matters. That is the real life situation. So the immune system is trained to deal with these kind of things. We are being bombarded with different kinds of pathogens all the time. It's not on Monday this one, on Tuesday this one. So if you vaccinate against a couple of epitopes or attenuated uh, 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 viruses or whatever, I don't think that overpowers the immune system. There is well, certainly no evidence for this. It's more to do with the formulation of things because you have to prepare antigen right and it has to be given in a certain formulation, but that's, that's nothing to do with the immune response as such. Can I yeah. quickly comment on that? Yeah. Because that's really strange. Um, it's largely considered potentially harmful in Russia, partly because everybody thinks, a lot of people think, and maybe they have the right to do so, that they have low quality vaccines and that everything that can work right and that here in Russia we have a higher chance of something going bad with vaccination than for example in Western Europe but then apparently uh, there is still this movement against vaccination despite probably the higher uh, quality control in the process. Well, for Germany, I can say it's it's very it, it's uh, it's very tightly controlled because the reason is there is a committee, the Robert Koch Institute, who uh, draws up um, a list of vaccinations that you should you should give to people from children to adult stage, um, and it recommends this. And, and and when you follow this recommendation and something goes wrong, the state pays for all the ensuing problems. Um, and of course, they, they have a scientific committee that decides on this. Um, and, and of course,
because of this, you have to report any side effect with this or that vaccine or this or that vaccination protocol to this committee. And they obviously collect the information. And, and of course, it's not hidden from the public. So it's very well known that the, the number of side effects is, is very, very low. Of course, the, the typical side effect of a vaccination is low-grade fever. But you wouldn't be surprised to see this. For example, if you hit yourself, if you play football and somebody really hits you badly, of course you have a low-grade fever, you just don't take notice. If you are vaccinated, and of course then the parents are a bit nervous and when there's something wrong with the baby, then they think it's all related to the vaccination, which may or may not be true. But I can tell you there's some, some really some strange uh, things. Um, in our area, people stage what they call a measles parties. So whenever there is a, a, an infant infected with measles, they call in their friends and bring their basically like naive in, uh, infants to, be in, to become naturally infected because it's considered to be better for you if you, have, if, you under, if you go through the natural infection rather than being vaccinated. Is that here? Is that here also quite popular? Uh, I've heard it was popular in, in the USA. Yeah. Well, chickenpox party you don't even have to have. Actually, just open the window and then basically everybody uh, gets infected. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really explain this kind of behavior, but yeah, it happens. Yeah, it is. It is. It is a bit strange. Um, but, I mean, what can you say? You just, have, you just have to speak out against this. But can we verify uh, by some means? Uh, the baby is back vaccinated, can we just take uh, his blood and insert vaccine and see how, how lymphocytes behave? Just, is there any sure procedure that ensures that there will be no side effects? I don't think so. I mean, the, the immune system, well, working with the immune system tells you you have to look at the entire organism. That's the whole point. It's, 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 a, it's a, sign, a, a science or a scientific uh, area where the whole organism matters. Of course, you can apply a reductionist approach and study things in the test tube, but most of the time it's better to study the whole animal. And I don't think you can predict all of these uh, side effects or potential side effects. But it won't be long before when the babies are born, of course, you do some uh, uh, postnatal screening for metabolic disorders, for example, as you all know. It won't be long before a tiny drop of blood is being taken from every baby and the whole genome is being sequenced and the parents will get a report a couple of days later and they will be told your baby has a heterozygous mutation that makes or creates susceptibility to this or that. Or so it might change. And then you might say, okay, well, with this particular MHC haplotype, you, it's very unlikely that you will be susceptible to this or that virus or whatever, and then you might decide. But I think on the whole, this is, for the moment, at least scientific fantasy. But uh, if we consider in metagenome, because not only the genome plays part, but also epigenetic things and metagenome, how the immune system is dependent Well, no, well, well, we know that the immune system does not develop properly if there is... So in a germ-free individual, the immune system does not develop normally. This is what we know. So from this, you can already say that there is interaction between the... in the genomic view of things, between the host genome and this micro, microbial genomes. So that's what we know. Of course... The immune system, I think, is the prime biological model, in my view, to study epigenetics because you are changing states. If you are going through infection and you're generating memory cells, these cells, although they have the same specificity, they have a different state of their physiology, which is caused by a change in the environment, i.e. infection. So studying epigenetics is, I think, best done, in my view, or at least one very interesting area of study is in the immune system. And there is a reason why our institute changed its name. It used to be the Institute of Immunobiology for almost 50 years. 
and very recently it has added epigenetics to its name precisely for the reason that we think this is an area that we should invest in to see whether that can help us understand some immunological uh, phenomena. But it's a huge task. I probably won't see the results of that, but uh, it's certainly going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, there are certain conditions when thymus is completely empty because of some aggression or function. So. And uh, I was wondering whether this empty thymus is preserved uh, during the lifetime of an individual. Well, empty thymus refers to some immunodeficiency syndrome, yes. you might say, yes. Well, if you have a, a block in T-cell differentiation, of course the thymus appears to be empty because T-cells just cannot respond, are either not uh, made at all or cannot respond to some signals. I discussed this IL-7 problem, for example, or IL-7 IL uh, signaling. Well, if, if these kind of developmental problems happen, if they're inborn errors of immunity, as it were, of course you can't change them unless you change the, in, in this case, the hematopoietic stem cell and supply it with the missing genetic function via gene therapy, for example. It's a little more difficult if the defect is in the stroma because the stroma is not so easily retrievable. Um, so it would be interesting to explore ways of creating, if we take that example, of creating artificial thymic tissue. One problem is not only from, the, from, uh, from inborn errors of uh, immunity, but for example, when you condition patients for bone marrow transplantation, very often they suffer from delayed reconstitution of the T-cell compartment because there is damage to the thymus. And if you were able to do this, you could retrieve a bit of thymic tissue, expand it perhaps in vitro, or even generate it anew from other cell types. And when the conditioning regimen is done, you transplant this into the patient, and this new tissue or, or protected tissue would resume function and generate T cells, which the endogenous thymus might not be able to do. So there's gene therapy, that is possible, yes, um, or perhaps some more advanced tissue engineering. Um, well, that, well the, the, the indirect way of doing this is to, do, to carry out bone marrow transplantation. You give the hematopoietic stem cells and they then make from some healthy donor and they then make T cells. So that is a way of circumventing that problem. Um, if you have an immunodeficiency, for example, in the B cell compartment, you can't make any antibodies like in immunodeficiency syndromes in humans that are called CVID, so common variable immunodeficiency, they suffer from lack of immunoglobulins, you simply inject them. You can inject them subcutaneously and they will dissipate in the entire organism and they can be treated by this very, very simple replacement therapy quite efficiently. Not all symptoms normally go away, but in some patients that it has spectacular results. So there are ways of mending deficiencies, but it's, it's always imperfect, and we try to think of ways to do this better. That is possible, but if you have a T-cell deficiency and that is not treated early, you will not see the adult stage. So you have no option, you cannot wait. You either do it right away or you don't. So that is, I think, one of the big problems. For example, there are patients that have RAC deficiencies or a, 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 a hypomorphic alleles of RAG where there is very little activity, so they only have very, very few lymphocytes, mature lymphocytes, so they have a, a, a diversity problem in certain ways, and that normally appears very early during life because some infection cannot be controlled for properly, so they have to be treated by uh, bone marrow transplantation.
But it's of course, I mean, as you can imagine, this is extremely expensive and complicated types of therapy, as you would expect uh, from these sort of complex problems. But that they work at all, I think, is is anyway amazing, and that it can be done successfully is a triumph of, of medicine. It's clearly so. It's immunization and these kind of things like transplantation of organs and manipulating the immune system in that way that the organ is maintained in a foreign environment, as it were, is, I think, quite spectacular. And we might, of course, say we don't understand how immuno immunology works or the immune system, but for some, in some instances, we can do a lot already. So this is the famous last words, huh? I just, I'm, I'm sorry to intrude, maybe there are hundreds of questions coming, but I wanted to ask if somebody has a question that when without an answer will not survive in the book tomorrow, something that's really special, urgent, very, very wanted. Is there something in that sense? Because I think that otherwise uh, we should be coming to an end because uh, our <laughs> lecture has been talking for a long time and Well, can we, that's basically saying, can we create an artificial immune system in the sense that we can produce a, a structure, structure or a molecule that would bind with a certain, certain affinity to any other chemical structure? That is your question. Well, you can, I give you a short answer. People have been working at using uh, ribonucleic acids or even DNA, single-stranded DNA, as so-called aptamers, because RNA in particular has very complex forms due to partially double-stranded structure, and RNA can wrap around structures quite avidly, and people have been using randomized ribonucleic acid oligonucleotides to select those that bind very strongly to a certain well, chemical. Uh, that is in vitro. Huh? No, no, this is, this, is, this is ribonucleotides that then bind to any chemical structure. The, the nature of the antigen does not matter in that sense. Yes. But I mean that, I mean uh, protein structure which can bind to any. Well, then you have to speak to protein engineers. Uh, I'm not one of those, but then it is, it is very difficult actually for even to, to create de novo uh, protein folds and protein folds that do not aggregate where you don't want them to and protein folds that have enough flexibility to do what you desire, mm -hmm. that is to interact with different kinds of chemical electron surfaces, basically. Um, I think people have tried to develop systems where they can develop new uh, protein domains, but that is, is very, very difficult. On paper, it should be possible, mm -hmm. but in practice... Yeah, yeah, but then still you, you still have to randomize. I mean, you can then say, okay, I'm just randomizing and make a library and then I select, but that is not endogenously generated. Mm -hmm. So our immune system is much better at this, much better than any bioengineer at the moment. So there's a, a lot to do. Well, I'm not sure whether God is involved here, but uh, we cannot compete with nature so easily. Yes, that is true. That is true. So now after this, thank you. After this last question, let me say that it was quite enjoyable for me to come here to your. Now I'm saying it in English. I, I I failed with Russian, but it's a beautiful city. I have to say, I walked through it, only parts of it, of course, around this particular area. It's really very beautiful. It was 
a very enjoyable and impressive um, uh, experience for me and I enjoyed your company and thank you for staying with me for these five days. I did not expect it. I thought, okay, maybe they come for the first day and then on Friday I will be alone talking to myself. <laughs> but fortunately that did not happen. So thanks very much for uh, going through that uh, long period of time with me. And you asked some really interesting and penetrating questions, some questions even I did not understand or could not answer. So I take something home and I will think about this and maybe that even uh, factors into our own work. So thanks very much again and hope to see you sometime again.